what happens when we die? It's a question that has exercised humanity's finest minds since the beginning of time. From a physical standpoint, death occurs when the body's vital functions stop entirely. Christianity teaches us our soul is immortal, that the soul separates from our earthly body to stand in judgment before God, and that the essence of who we are lives on. Many struggle and are almost paralyzed by the fear of death. As a former hospice nurse, someone who's personally struggled with losing a boyfriend tragically in my early years, then losing the majority of my immediate family in the more recent years, and someone who's recently discovered the gift of mediumship, I hope to ease some of those fears today. As we start, remember that within each of us resides an inner knowing. Take a moment to reach way down deep and tap into it, that which our Father, the Creator, made available. Near-death experiences are a common pattern of conscious experience that occurs to people who are on the verge of death. For example, in a cardiac arrest from which they are resuscitated. And basically they consist of elements that are common all over the world. Not every person has all of the elements, but among the things that people say are, that they hear the doctor say something like, oh my God, he's dead, or we've lost her, which is very surprising to them because they say that I have never felt so alive as when I heard that doctor say I was dead. Because from their point of view, they feel that they distance themselves from their physical body and they watch the scene of the resuscitation typically from a point of view above it. As this progresses, they eventually wake up to the fact that, oh, this must be something to do with death. And at that point, they enter into states of consciousness that no matter how articulate they may be, they say there are no words for it. The automobile accident we had was really quite a, a, a terrifying thing. We had been on family vacation and uh, I was driving the car. Tamara was sitting next to me and actually holding onto my hand and she had reclined her seat back um, and was taking a nap. And I was driving with my left hand. I had set the cruise control at 75. That was as fast as I could legally go. I was hurrying. And uh, the two boys were in the back. Griffin, our toddler, was in his car seat. And Spencer was sitting behind me, who was at the time was seven years old. There was crosswinds and reports of different things, but what I believe happened is that I, um, I may have just dozed off for just a second when you just nod off, but the car swerved to the right, I overcorrected to the left and lost control of the car. And it began to roll not off the road, but down the road at, at 75 miles an hour. It was a horrific accident. Um, I blacked out for that. I don't remember actually rolling. But when the car came to a stop, I was completely conscious. And the first thing I heard was Spencer, my seven-year-old, crying hysterically in the back seat of the car. What, what had actually happened is that both of my legs had been crushed and shattered. The left leg was eventually amputated above the knee. My back had been damaged. My rib cage was damaged. My lungs were collapsing. My right arm had almost been torn out. There was no muscle through the rotator cuff or anything holding it on. And I had a large laceration under the arm. And then the seat belt had cut through my abdomen and ruptured all my intestines. I, I was an absolute mess. I had no idea. All I knew is I was in pain. I was losing consciousness. I couldn't breathe. And here was my son crying hysterically in the back seat. But that's when I realized no one else was crying. And it was in that horrific moment um, that I knew, first of all, that Tamara was gone. 
and Griffin, uh, my, my little toddler, um, the car seat had broken up and he had been ejected from the car. And my first thought was, where's my little boy? And yet it was, even in the asking, it almost felt like the answer came and I, it, he's gone. He's gone. And it was the most horrific hellish moment. I, I don't, I don't share it to be graphic or, 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 or morbid, but I wanted to, to set up the contrast. There I was in the darkest moment of my life. You know, half the family's gone. I've got a hysterical seven year old and I'm losing consciousness. And it was in that moment that light came. It felt like tangible light. It felt as if light came and surrounded me. And this light was, was loving me and comforting me in this darkest, darkest moment of my life. And I began to rise above, or it felt like I was rising above the accident, like I was being delivered out of all that trauma. And it was a little bit confusing. I mean, I, I was wondering, how, how am I okay? Suddenly there was Tamara. I mean, she was absolutely gorgeous and radiant. There was no head trauma. She was beautiful just like she had always been to me, but even more so. And we began to communicate. And she was literally telling me, Jeff, you, you've got to go back. You've got to go back. You cannot come. You can't stay here. You've got to go back. And it was an interesting experience of choice because there I was looking at the woman that I, I loved more than life. And yet I knew I had a little boy crying in the back seat of that car. And uh, I got to make a choice. What was I going to do? And I, I chose to come back. Now, I said the most profound goodbye I'll ever say. And I found myself moving freely around a hospital. Now, I, I have no concept of time in this bubble of light. I was later told people had arrived at the scene. They were able to get Spencer out of the car, who was banged up a little bit, but my little seven-year-old was not physically injured terribly. He literally walked away from the accident. With the extent of my injuries, they, they knew they could do nothing for me there, so I was life-flighted to the closest level one trauma center. Jeff Olson he was badly injured, and he was flown to my trauma center. And when I went in to see Jeff, he was unconscious, and there was a team of physicians and other providers taking care of him. And everything slowed down, in a sense. Everything became quiet, like watching a TV show with the volume turned off. And standing above the gurney in the air was his deceased wife, Tamara, whom I never met, but who I knew immediately. The physicians, the providers were still talking to each other. They were still doing everything that they were doing. But for me, everything was quiet, except for Tamara, who expressed her profound gratitude for the care that Jeff was receiving. I was in the hospital for over five months. I had 18 surgeries in total. But probably the most profound thing about my hospital stay was at the end of the hospital stay. I had gone from ICU to surgical recovery, and I was actually in the rehabilitation unit. It was after all of that, and I was actually just weeks away from going home. I rolled on my side, and my brother was there, my younger brother. My two brothers had just been by my side continually. I think they almost lost their jobs to be with me. And I recall falling asleep and thinking, wow, it feels so good to go to sleep. I haven't slept for months. It, I was in this deep, beautiful sleep when that light came. But this time the light dispensed, it went away. It was like a fog lifting off a lake and I was in the most beautiful place. And it felt so physical. I could feel everything as if the energy was surging through every cell of my body and yet, I believe I was out of the body, and, and, and yet it felt so real, so, so physical. And I was running about just gleefully thinking, I'm home, when I got the message, I'm not here to stay. And, and at that time, there was this corridor off to my left, and I knew intuitively I'm to go that way. And so I began to make my way down the corridor. And as I did, at the end of the corridor, I could see a crib. 
Now, Griffin, my little boy who had been thrown from the car and killed instantly in the accident, I mean, I, I can't explain the grief and pain in those months in the hospital thinking about what had happened, but I raced to this crib. And there was my little boy. I mean, sleeping as peacefully as when I had glanced in that rearview mirror. And I, I, I picked him up and it was so physical. And there I was holding him. And, and I began to weep just thinking, wow, how can this be? And as I held him, I felt this intense presence come up behind me. I felt these divine arms come and wrap around me and my little boy and hold us. And, and it's like the lid just came off of everything. And there was this pure communication that literally said, there's nothing to forgive. Everything is in pure divine order. It's, it's almost like it was this higher perspective of having always been. And, and, and that this life was simply a stage or, or, or a ball game or, or a, you know, a, an act in a actless, endless series of eternal lives. It was incredible. In all that peace and beauty, I, I chose uh, to, to kiss my little boy and give him back to turn him over to, to the divine. And, and as I did that, then I woke up, you know, in the hospital bed, back to the amputation and the injuries and all that had been going on. And, um, and yet I had a little bit different perspective about love and about the divine and about even my own existence and what that looked like in an endless realm of eternity. Near-death experiencers have very similar stories. Most people say they see a tunnel of light, and some say they rise out of their bodies until they're floating through space. And almost always, people report to have seen and were met by their loved ones who have already passed. Every story I've ever heard, they feel an overwhelming love, stating that it's so great they can't describe it. They usually say they want to go home and don't want to come back to Earth. The human experience was designed so that this remains a mystery until we die. Hold on to your faith and trust in God's plan. Let go of fear. Listen to more of these near-death experiences and accept there are too many people telling the same story for it to be a coincidence. All emotions have a frequency, so let go of fear and transcend it into the peace frequency. There is so much more to this reality than we can see with our human eyes. So feel and know it in your heart. This is a first in a series of videos on the afterlife. In the next video, I'll be sharing my personal afterlife story, so stay tuned. Please share this video with at least one person. Also, like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you'd like more information on the Lightworker Healing Protocol, please put a message in the comments with your email and I'll reach out to you there is financial assistance available. This divine prayer removes spiritual attachments, helps facilitate communication with you and your spirit guides, begins healing your body, and gives you protection along with too many more benefits to list. I love each and every one of you and thank you for being a part of my journey.